the outrageous over the top sea otter stew and all the comedic <laughs> moments that we love so right. oh sea otter stew one of the best <laughs> episodes of anime ever that episode caught me completely off guard to the point where i'm sitting there watching it my wife is next to me and i just start dying i'm like ah she's like what are you watching she's just seeing grown men take their shirts off and stare at each other with these lustful eyes and i was like yeah let's not talk about this all right Good evening, so ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a special episode of Anime Izakai Podcast. Tonight, we will be covering the most golden show of all time, Golden Kamui. I'm joined by a very special cast and crew tonight. First off, we have Sredden. Hello, everyone. Next up, we have Ku. Yo. And we have a very special guest, one of the most knowledgeable anime people in the entire universe, we have Justin. Uh, I don't know about that, bro, but uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> Happy to talk about some Golden Kamui tonight. <laughs> hina, hina. Happy to have you all here. <laughs> and I'm your host, Sasha. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, Golden Kamui, it's a very special anime. I would say it's the dark horse of the previous season because it's got this fanfare, but it's not internationally acclaimed, and it doesn't have... The same amount of fans as some of these very commercial shows, uh, but an absolutely enjoyable story. We will talk about season three. We'll get into reviewing it and our thoughts about the massive twists and turns that season takes. However, we do want to give you guys a little bit of a deeper dive into just what is Golden Kamui, if you're not familiar with it. And then we'll take a look at seasons one, two, and finally, we'll jump into season three. So uh, we'd like to give it up to the man who introduced us to Golden Kamui and who really recommended that we check it out. Justin, can you tell us about the show? If someone is unfamiliar with it, they're looking to get into it, they're hesitant, they might pull the trigger, they might not. What do you say to that person? How do you convince them, hey, this is what Golden Kamui is all about? Definitely. Um, well, I think to start exactly as you said, you know, Golden Kamui was a show now that I believe started 2018 and really was kind of one of those shows that when stacked up against the other shows of, you know, returning sequels, popular, you know, new series finally getting animated for the first time. Um, Golden Kamui really didn't get, you know, the spotlight that I think it deserves. Um, and as we'll talk a little bit about later, particularly for the use of their CGI. Um, but to take a step back and, you know, really kind of break down Golden Kamui for individuals, you know, who may not be familiar with the show or looking to kind of pick something up, especially as we're kind of, you know, um, migrating between seasons here during the holiday uh, break. Um, Golden Kamui is a show that I would say really has a little bit for everybody. There's a good amount of action. There's a overarching adventure. Um, you know, there's pieces of history that's explained throughout the show from multiple different perspectives. And I really think it's that collection of genres that when it comes together and when it's done in the right way, really makes it shine. Um, and I think, you know, for individuals who, again, aren't familiar with the show, what I could really compare it to is a Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood meets Vinland Saga. It really does, you know, that best kind of culmination of this wide ensemble of unique characters, characters that, you know, everybody who watches it, I think there's going to be one or two or, you know, maybe even three characters that you really align with as you grow and continue to learn it with them throughout the show. And overall, you know, the, the overarching kind of story really reflects on this legend of this Ainu goal one of the you know indigenous people of japan during this you know short time after the japan russia war and again it's a show that it's one hell of a ride you're going to be laughing in stitches you may be crying at some moments and you're really going to be holding on to your end of your seat at the end of the day so again really excited to be on the podcast with you guys tonight and um looking forward to talk about you know golden kamui awesome awesome great job giving us some insight into golden kamui Very well we've done. all become yes We've all become major fans of the show now. Major, major, major. Uh, but with that being said, so I caught up to this a little bit earlier than Ku and Sretton did. However, they're fresh off the boat of catching up to the show. So you guys just literally blitzed through seasons one and two and three. Uh, but mm -hmm. let's take a step back to one and two. What were you guys' thoughts of the original season? And Justin, feel free to jump in at any point as well. Yes, we will oh, take assistance. Uh, straight ahead, start. Okay, I will go. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think 
So uh, at first, like it, it kind of got me. Like the first episode, I thought like, it started off, like, uh, I think fairly strong because I, I believe the first episode was when uh, you kind of go over. Was it the first episode when he he starts hunting bears and he's like diving into like a uh, uh, bear dens? No, no, he he fights uh, that, no. that CGI bear. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. First first episode is <laughs> the guy uh, like Sugimoto is taking a leak in the river, or the guy is, and the guy's super drunk, and then the old man tells him the story about the tattoos, r- okay. and it's revealed that he has one of the tattoos himself. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Kind of yep. it was like the with the story of it. Like I thought it was actually like a, it like just kind of how they dropped it. It wasn't like one of those just kind of like big kind of grandiose things. It was just kind of like a, a casual conversation with a drunk old dude. Where it just sounded like just where it, it kind of sounded like it was just a, a fake, not not a really a fake story, but almost kind of like maybe like a fairy tale type of deal, or um, or some some sort of thing like that, and then just kind of like how it ended up developing with uh where where it, you know the guy ends up like he where, where I don't even believe Sugimoto even believed the guy until the guy actually ended, ended up showing up with like showing up to him with Sugimoto's gun into his face and basically it was just saying I spoke too much. And then that whole kind of situation ended up happening, and then uh, and then um, where then Sugimoto thought like, okay, maybe there's actually something to this, and then from there it was actually a, it kind of just uh, started just picking up from there. Um, sorry, uh, Ku, or did you have anything that you were saying or that you wanted to say? Oh no no no, you're good. Go ahead. Um, let's see. So certain season one as a whole. How would you say you liked season one? Why did you even continue into seasons two and three? Like, what was it about season one that stuck out to you? Uh, well, by far the characters. Like, all the characters were so interesting. Like, they're all completely just completely different. Um, they also just kind of go. I don't. I don't believe. I can't remember if the first season had too much of like the flip flopping, but I know like later on, like in the second season, like you go from uh, like hating characters or liking characters to absolutely hating them or absolutely liking them. And then it just kind of keeps going from there. Uh, did, was that more of the second season, or was it the first season? I would say second season is when we mm-hmm. saw people switch sides. Because season okay. one was all about estab- establishing the sides. Mm-hmm. And if I had one knock on the show from the original season, would be it introduced so many characters. It was hard to keep track of who's who, what's their motivation, what's their association. Which is why yeah. I think the latter seasons become so much better even though the first one is still really good um yeah. by its own merits okay. so ku what were your thoughts on the first season uh so the first season was actually uh kind of as you mentioned it was just too much things going on at once it was kind of just you know you got the lore dump you got like the introduction of all these cast members and then at first, I thought it was going to be okay because since you're just binge watching it, and then they seem to focus on uh, Sugimoto and Aserpa, like I didn't think that would be that much of an issue. Going into season two, however, you realize that everyone <laughs> is is actually fairly important to the story, and like they're not just so, the supporting cast, but they're all basically kind of the main cast. Um, so, with that being said, like season one, it felt very slow, but with the introduction of season two, I felt like it was actually. Uh, actually going by pretty fast with, with all the information that they're giving you and I actually enjoyed it quite a bit just with the fact that it was kind of introducing you to the kind of humor and the theme of what golden kamui has to offer you uh, i actually was surprisingly uh like delighted to see what the show had to offer it was like season one just felt like a kind of a, a, a complete blur um we're at the time like i felt like oh man these were like really memorable moments but then just like just like the second half of the second season is when it actually like where I, I remember it a lot better either like just kind of ridiculous like humor or um like the story actually felt like it was moving forward like things were actually like, like starting to happen and then of course in like season three like like at least half the season i'm like every episode i was like oh damn oh damn it just it kind of just kept going from there hmm Absolutely. Yeah, I would say from what I remember with season one, I really liked the knowledge they had about the Ainu culture and then the different ways that they showed how people caught animals or how they lived or how they cooked their food or how they didn't cook their food. Um, So I thought that was really informative. But season one was just a very unusual blend of humor, action, and then historical knowledge that you don't really get from a lot of shows. And I remember thinking... Wow, I, I like a lot of these characters. Uh, Sugimoto is awesome right off the bat. And I just, I didn't know what to expect. And one thing looking back at the whole show as a whole now, I like the idea of 
you feel like every episode is almost a survival episode. Like you don't know who is actually going to survive and live and whether it's an opponent or if it's their surroundings and their environment because they're in the middle of basically what feels like a tundra. And so you just don't know who's going to go or when or how. And um, I, I like that setup about season one. It was just so different from every other show I liked, which is why I stuck with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, my, my favorite, mo- like, uh, now it's, like, fi- it's slowly coming back to me. Uh, my favorite kind of arc of that season was definitely, the, it was kind of like the hunter battle. Uh, it was at the hunter battle, bet- uh, or sniper battle, I'm sorry, uh, between Ogata and, um, oh, shoot, I was going to have these guys' names remembered. Uh, uh, Basali, the Russian sniper? Uh, or wait, uh, that's t- Tanigaki. T- Tanigaki. Um, oh, right, oh, yeah, right. Tanigaki. Yeah, yeah. Like that one, and also with uh, the also the other sniper too. That basically the Tanigaki took his gun. The the boner guy. That guy was awesome as well. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, because okay, because because Tanigaki and that guy. I ended up going from when I first saw them. I ended up hating them because I'm thinking, oh my god, they're gonna kill this wolf. Yeah. And then I immediately am thinking, like they're not they're not gonna be redeemed. But just like through kind of like their story, uh, and also I mean, not Tanigaki is like one of my favorite characters. When I just like hated this guy at that point, but I think after like that moment, um, once that uh, once that one hunt, uh, the hunter guy died, uh, and then kind of Tanigaki kind of just like he started having like his like the moments and everything. I thought like damn, this guy's like really, really it's actually a really good character. And then just followed up with with basically the sniper battle with Ogata trying to protect all the people that were helping him when he was originally trying to. Uh, like we kind of come after them. Like that whole arc, was I thought was actually, well, I think was my favorite from season one. Hmm. I don't know. About yeah, you. I don't Absolutely. know. I think I think the only character <laughs> that I really enjoyed was Sugimoto and Serpa. Just their chemistry and their dynamic together. Like, I did, but I started yeah. liking more characters later on. And cool, you're referring just to season one. Just to season one, right? Okay. All right. Well, yeah. With season two, it completely changed that. Uh, you basically <laughs> fell in love with every single character. Like, I was kind of hoping that you can easily just kill someone off so you can kind of just focus on a smaller cast. Because <laughs> I, I think actually in season two, the, the only gripe I had with season two was I felt like the plot was just too convoluted at this point because they're going back and forth, switching between different teams. And then, uh, you know, they have so much going on. I, I know that it's supposed to be like an historical anime as well. But yeah, there was just too much lore dump. And I it's it hard for me to keep up with it like maybe if i were to have watched it week by week rather than just binge watch like 36 episodes or like 24 <laughs> episodes in like a week or so you know there was just too much information to to take in at once so that's what that's what really messed me up i think and then uh as you mentioned earlier with season one i like you didn't know like where it's gonna go like basically by the end of season one i seriously thought that uh like a majority of the the, the i knew people was gonna die because they're helping out sugimoto and the others and i seriously thought that like okata and the others like they're gonna die as well but you know like everyone basically survived and now they're teaming up together so i, I thought that was uh like interesting to say the least I can I can definitely see like why um, I can understand why people would kind of just drop the entire thing just after season one because it it felt like it didn't because it was it was um, it was so heavy on just establishing like the lore and the characters that it didn't really move this the like the, the story itself forward that much uh, mm-hmm. and I and I know I don't know for like a lot of people especially with uh, just the times we are now like people just need like that like the everything to be moving like as fast as possible um, yeah if I didn't hear from like you guys basically like uh, um, um, it was uh, Sasha and Justin. I like it that basically, like, uh, with sec- the second season, like how much it picks up. Uh, I probably like I because I think the first season is actually when uh, I remember Sasha was like, asking me, he's like, Hey man, how far are you in the first season? I'm like, yeah, I'm still at episode five, <laughs> and it, it took me a while to actually get going. But once I actually cleared the first season, I blew through the second and third season. Mm-hmm. It was really no, I, fast. I think that's really like a fair assessment of the first season where it almost does feel like at times, you know, you're kind of dragging your feet in the mud of exactly as, you know, Sret and you and Ku said, where mm-hmm. there's a lot of lore being established. There's, you know, a lot of history focus on the Ainu, which for a show that you're joining for the first time, you know, maybe you're hooked by it, maybe you're not yet. And it's something that, again, like with even the legend of the gold, you know, I think like you just said, Sret and with kind of this expectation or almost kind of instant gratification that happens more and more regularly right and shows there you know were probably a lot of viewers that when initially watching it they weren't getting you know those payoffs right off the bat every few episodes it's something where you know the larger vision wasn't being kind of presented in a you know as efficient manner as it could have been 
But mm-hmm. exactly as you guys said, once that gets into season two and once you have, you know, all the factions, all the key players established, that's when it's finally like, okay, we don't need to hold your hand here anymore. We're right. now just going <laughs> to get into the action. We're going to get into the stories that you love and we're going to get into the outrageous over the top sea otter stew and all the comedic <laughs> moments that we love. So, right. oh, sea otters too. One of the best <laughs> episodes of anime ever. That episode caught me completely off guard to the point where I'm sitting there <laughs> watching it. My wife is next to me, and I just start dying. I'm like, ah! She's like, what are you watching? She's just seeing grown men take their shirts off and stare at each other with these lustful eyes. And I was like, yeah, let's not talk about this, all right? Like, honey, this is what I'm into now. So come to yes. me. Let me tell you about that. Um, yeah, I, I, like, I always say it, but season two was more of season one just on steroids, and like from the get-go you have an episode about a taxidermist who feels like a character straight out of dexter <laughs> and it, it's so ridiculous you can't help but continue watching and seeing the people switch sides i remember season one ended on a whimper for me which is why i was like mm, i don't know how this show's gonna go mm-hmm, and right. then you see how it ties back but season two was just it really got me going and i thought it was very close to being a perfect season. It just, I think the first half wasn't quite as strong as the second half from what I remember. However, I do want to give a major shout out to season two, introducing and developing one of my favorite characters, maybe my second or third favorite, who is uh, Koito or Tsukushima, because he works under Tsurumi, but you can tell he has his own code that he follows, and he even takes one of the skins for himself. So Tsurumi's under the impression that, yo, there are only five fake skins made, but he took one. And you can tell, like, he's a thinker. He he, he wants to be on the right side and be justful, or um, <clears throat> he, he's someone who wants to follow the idea of justice. But at the end of the day, when you work under someone... They could be corrupt. They could be maniacal. And that's pretty much what Tsurumi is. Uh, so getting to see his story and then just how important it is. And then the background later on in season three, I just think a lot of the characters are so wonderfully developed that, yeah, season two was just wow, wow. Yeah, like th- some of these characters, you kind of go with just like they're a lot of characters um, in just anime in general. They always have just these crazy appearances, these crazy looks. But in the, but in the in um in Golden Kamui, there's so many almost basic looking characters. I'm I, I just kept thinking like, all right, there's no way these people these like these uh, characters are gonna be major major players in this anime. Uh, going mm-hmm. with the Skishima, I mean, the guy looked basic. Or you just he's missing a nose. Uh, but then we also had a, <laughs> but then we also had like the twins, oh, the, the, God, with the, yeah. like the two twins that ba- they like the, just how they look is like this is the face of like. What it looks like, just like a basic looking anime character, like that's like what I like what I picture in my mind. And here we are with still this guy missing like, every single limb of his body, and he's still like one of like a like not a major <laughs> character, but he's like a side sub character, whatever you want to call it. But he's still around. He's still there. Mm. Oh uh, yeah. I was <laughs> The Nikaido twins are some really great characters that, as you said, Trent, when you first get introduced to them, you don't really think much of them. No, but just not with at all. all the interactions and over the top engagements that they have with Sugimoto, and, you know, furthermore into um, just losing various limbs and all those stuff, like, <laughs> it just gets so over the top, and it just becomes a character that continually is kind of sprinkled in over time. And just, I think, even from the creator, you know, he probably must have kind of some endearment for that character to keep on bringing them back after, you She's know, coming. all the stuff that they've been through throughout the series. <laughs> Dude, and their interaction with that, uh, the gentleman who develops weapons for them, like the secret weapons, I was dying when he'd come on because he just looks crazy. He's like, hey, guys, I got some for you. It's a it's a leg, but it shoots bullets. <laughs> oh, he's awesome. Oh, or was it a hand? Was it the hand that was the gun? No, 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 it was no, both the leg. The leg. Yeah. Okay, okay. Oh, the foot. yeah, the foot. Wait, dude, the fucking the, hand? Oh, no, the hand was like chopsticks. Dude, just fucking chopsticks, dude. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes it so great, man. I mean, you're expecting one thing, and then Golden Kamui just complete, see, completely hits you from left field, which is absurd, yeah. over the top shit. So, it's yeah, great. and you I will say, to expect. season two absolutely built the tension up to a boiling point because they're in the prison. You think they're about to escape, and all of a sudden, Wilk gets shot, and then Sugimoto gets shot as well, and you're like. Whoa, 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 where is this going now? Right? <laughs> Boom. Um, so with that being said, I think we've done a pretty good job of taking a look at and talking about seasons one and two. Let's talk about the granddaddy. Uh, in my opinion, the best season so far. 
It just wrapped up on Monday. What do you guys think? Season three, how does this stack up? What are your thoughts? Well, from from my point of view, I actually enjoyed season two a lot better just because I felt like season one was the introduction to lore. Season two was the buildup of the characters. They kind of put a like a, a, a freeze on the plot itself, and they were just focusing on developing the characters. And season three it was kind of like mixing both of that together, but they're trying to progress the plot along. And I really was hoping for season three to like be the last one because I wanted like <laughs> there to be progression, and I thought that we were gonna get it. But uh, I mean, I'm glad this can be season four. But I felt like they're just at this point, it's kind of they're just kind of like dragging it along a little bit too much. I feel like mm. fair. fair. I don't know because this this season was basically just focused on like I mean it was just like it was it was it was its own arc, and it was able to spend like a I think I think. I think about the like, the right amount of time just for everything, just kind of like mm-hmm. how they went through, because mm-hmm. um, it seemed like it seemed like with this arc it was almost not really like uh, they weren't really looking for the for the skins. It was more kind of like a, just a, a, establishing their teams or their sides or just trying to find like, out more. It was like a rescue mission. Like yeah. the whole season of three was just like a rescue yeah. mission, basically. But, yeah, but it was ba- but it was because they 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 knew or thought there was like a high chance of a Sherpa remembering something uh, that only she would know. Of of like where the the gold is since you know they uh, they took out the other person that would have known that <laughs> at the end of the second season. But no, uh, I, I think that. both of those make a, a lot of sense, and I agree with Ku as well. I think this season, um, you know, we we had you know a few different environments that we found ourselves with, with the characters of you know the different towns, um, the different kind of like flashback locations. But again, when you do take a step back, you know, there really isn't much that's happening, and especially the Stratton's point of, you know, it really is at the end of the day to sum it all up, a rescue mission. So mm-hmm. I, I definitely think that's something that as the series progresses, um, I think is a big thing, you know, that I'm sure many viewers will like want to see is, you know, that, that quicker progression, at least more, you know, continued variety, just so we kind of always have, you know, things staying fresh. So Right. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it's fair, uh, fair. Yeah, the, um, the, like how this the the show started. The first episode, I mean, I thought it was uh, it, it was it was okay. But the second episode though is like kind of like when it brings you right back into it. And just the, the the second episode of the third season was just absolutely it was just ridiculous. It was just like, it, yeah, it's more of like it seems like <laughs> it seems I don't know if it's the author or they they just like having these guys just run around just 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 butt ass naked. And just, just <laughs> like, destroying everybody. Um, I mean, Dude, they have... <laughs> but the animation? The this animation is so I was good. just like, oh. oh. Funny, man. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to cut you off, Shred. No, I just no, had no, to get that in that's there. That's cause... perfectly fine. Um, I also, uh, where they had like those moments, and also, <laughs> uh, this, they also gave you like the like the chance to really like... Because I think at the second episode is when I started... Re- like, like Skishima, and also that other guy that I can't remember that's in love with uh, Surumi. I can't remember. I, oh, I knew you were talking about the weird name. eyebrow guy. Yeah, Koito. 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 Yeah. Like those. Like after that episode, like I, I both, I love both of those characters. Uh, when you were basically where it's like, cause Koito like really doesn't know Sugimoto, so it's like when he basically went in his berserk mode, he just beat the shit out of his own team <laughs> and like everybody. He's like, all right, this is his plan, right? Like he has a plan, and while he's basically just like trying to, he's just taking out everybody, and he's just ready to basically just take an axe to somebody's face. Um, that like that whole like uh that that episode kind of gave me like the. Gave yeah, like I think a lot of people like the opportunity to basically just like, because again it was another one of those like character like sw- like swaps where I didn't care for them I didn't hate them didn't really like them they were just kind of there just kind of thought they were just basic characters, but then the third season introduced them to be like like the main cast again, and hmm. and then I like them now but we'll see like later on in the, the fourth season if anything changes with them. Yeah, I, I'd say for season three that was actually a strength. The teams that they had yeah. reminded me of group projects back in school. You always get like those people that you're like, oh my gosh, I agree with maybe one person in this group, these other two scrubs. Ah, <laughs> oh, why did you stick me with them? And that's what you feel is like, you know, there's a lot of misunderstandings with each other, which creates great humor and then yeah. random mm-hmm. naked fight scenes in the winter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or like even Shiraishi being with Asripa and um, Ogata and Kiroranke, you're like, all right, how is this actually going to work out at all? You right. got comic relief, you got innocent girl, and then you got these two, you know, edge lord of darkness kids. over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're like, uh, but I, I think that's what made season three so interesting for me was I, um, I got attached to the characters a lot more, and I liked the depth that they went into, like Ogata's background with 
his his obsession of making sure everybody has a guilty side to them. Everyone is evil in some demented way. Um, no one is purely clean because he can't get over the fact that you know his brother was someone who was pretty much clean in every aspect. And so I thought that was great psychology getting into his character. Um, Tsukushima and the story about his wife and then how basically like you, you don't know if you can trust Tsutomi like everything this guy says is to twist you towards his side um, so I thought that was great development and then getting to hear about the past with so uh, not, not Sonia Sophia and how these guys killed Alexander the second like I thought pound for pound if we're looking at like episode per episode I thought season three had the most impactful episodes um i'd say out of all of them like maybe the the episode mm. where they go to the circus but i actually found that pretty entertaining i'm not gonna lie Same. um was the weakest link in the whole season but from pretty much when they crossed the border that and they have the secret sniper fight or secret sniper fight um <laughs> but when they have that that's pretty much where the season just goes into a whole different direction that I really like to uh, the Batosai, the Manslayer, right? Like that reminded me of Kenshin and it gave Hijikata some more character development. You're like, okay, I see this, this man is a gangster in his own right. Um, <laughs> so for me, and then, I, I mean, if we're going to jump into it. So I laughed my ass off at the sea otter stew episode. I was dying when they had to uh, thaw her eye from Sugimoto's <laughs> butt. I'll just leave it at that. Like that, that episode was the most tense I had felt watching anime yeah. in quite some time. And then that comes out of nowhere, and I'm just like in tears. I'm like, ah, <laughs> it was pulled off so well. Yep. Oh, yeah. So boy. for me, just the, the peaks in season three were too damn good yeah. for me to say, yeah, it's anything less than awesome. Um, uh-huh. So I really liked it. But Justin, you've been with the mm-hmm. show since its inception. How did you like season three? How did you take it? Because you've had to wait a few years for this payoff, yeah. whereas we blitzed through it. Mm-hmm. No, um, I I think it was was really good. It definitely you know had some shortcomings, which I'll which I'll get to in a little bit. But um, I think like you said, you know, Sasha, uh, for season three, and I really liked you know your analogy of group projects and you know joining together and having individuals that really pull their weight, don't pull their weight, and and all these type of things. But I think it's almost in the fact where these this was really a season where if you think about it in the group project mindset, it was almost that the teacher was saying, oh, hey, I know you always join, you know, with your buddies and stuff like that's not happening. You're joining with the weird kid that nobody ever (laughs) wants to be with. And it's really that dynamic that when you get these individuals that normally, you know, you wouldn't ever expect to be traveling together um, or you don't really know, you know, what that chemistry is going to hold. That's where the series really continues to shine. And I think season three was a really great testament to that. Um, but I guess, you know, to kind of talk about season three as an overview, you know, Stenka, obviously really great. You know, who doesn't want to see a series where you just get a bunch of brawly looking dudes going into the barn at God knows what hour, just beating the shit out of each other <laughs> to prove, you know, their male dominance. It's like, yo, if that was me and I just like walked into this bar or this, you know, barn and there's this a bunch of dudes with their shirt offs beating the shit out of each other. I'm like, I'm doing an immediate 180 and I'm like, nah, fuck that. I'm going home. I'll see you guys later. Like, I'll, go, I'll give two shits about this gold. Like, I ain't doing this. But, um. Again, with, with all the great characters that come into play and um, with just, you know, how much they really shine off each other with the comedy. Like, even in that Stanka episode when, you know, they're running away from both Sugimoto, who's gone complete berserk, but also, you know, this Wolverine that's really been a pain in their side for the last two episodes and hiding in the uh, the sauna. <laughs> that's right. And, you know, beating, beating the crap out of each other with... Um, with the one like leaf or branch to uh, help take away. <laughs> oh you know, yeah. Oh, and yeah. Everything. I was dying, man. Like, as you said, with sea other stew and some of the other moments in the series, like golden Kamui really is a show that, you know, you expect <laughs> a lot of action, you expect a lot of great storytelling. And then they just ever so subtly just, you know, insert that over the top comedy that just has you in stitches. So I'm really glad, you know, that that continued to be a key pillar or foundation, you know, for the series as a whole. Um, and then again, I think we had a, a lot of good, you know, lore building with the flashbacks of, um, you know, Kiranke, Wilk, um, and um, the, oh my God, I'm blanking on her name. Sophia. Uh, Sophia. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that was really great, you know, to really kind of paint better pictures of what they've, you know, experienced in the history of this world, how they've ended up where they are and, you know, kind of why they have their stake in the claim for this Ainu gold. Um, 
But even more so, it really kind of just shows that with this wide band of characters, you know, even though they do majority, you know, have this the similar location of where the series take place, the military relation, it just shows how many crossovers there really are where, you know, these paths kind of intertwine and weave back and forth that you really wouldn't expect. So um, I think that was something that was really great in this season as well to just continue to reinforce on that lore and just give us what we love. Lots of great stories, lots of great comedic moments, and that continued build hype as we move to the future. Hmm. Th- that's the one thing I used to like, actually... Uh, I hate back in the day was like was when people when uh when shows would go into like backstories of characters, I would always mm-hmm. be like oh my god like just move on with the story. But now it's just, I like <laughs> with like a show like this, I actually wanted to know their backstories and uh, like it was also done like I, I don't know it was just done like you know I don't know if it was like a whole different way than like other shows do it. But like um I know like a lot of other shows like they have kind of like those uh like certain amount of time where they can't like actually have like a whole episode that's that's given to them to kind of explain, like, their backstory, how, like, where they came from. Um, there's a few shows that I know that we watched last season, like, uh, like, Haikyuu, there was a couple episodes where they'd give maybe, like, five, ten minutes, but this one, they actually had, like, the entire, sh- like, the entire episode to basically just get to know, like, or, like where they came from, and I, I think for me, like, the, like, the third season was definitely, like, this, their strong suit was, like, just the backstories with the characters, because they already, they established them as, like, main characters, like, in the second season, but the third one kind of brought them, like, into, like, more, um... God, what's the term? Like, uh, uh, I don't want to say, like, but like likable, but it, there's like another term for that. I'm trying to think, but I'm blanking on it. But it's something like that. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I think I think that makes a lot of sense, and I think it's right. it's exactly like you said, Stratton, where you know they give you just enough of these characters where you have that investment, and they don't yeah. do it too much. And I think that's something that's really important in shows because if you either decide to go too much into a character or if you're going into a character's background just for the sake of doing it and there's really not right, kind right. of that payoff or rationale, then it's right. like, okay, I, w- at what point am I kind of wasting time here? At what point is it just like, you know, I, I don't care about this character and they just kind of get thrown to the wayside. So um, I, I totally agree. Mm. I think there's only one character I actually did not... Like, I never like I never really cared for him from the beginning to the end was a Kuranke. I don't know why, I just never cared for the guy. Uh, I don't, like, I always, I felt like it was just kind of a weird, almost, like, introductory, like, when he just joined their group, because mm-hmm. they just said, like, oh, like, he's, like, uh, he's basically, like, their uncle, and he kind of, he's, like, oh, like, we can trust him, and he just kind of joined them, and then that was about it, <laughs> and then he was just kind of, like, along with them in the, in the, the, I guess their team, mm-hmm. but yeah, he's, like, yeah. the, he's really the only character I'm just, like, yeah, whatever. I just can't trust a man with those earrings and that beard style, so. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Well, that's fucked up, bro. Yeah, what the <laughs> hell, man? Bro. He's out here trailblazing in the 1800s or whatever year they're in. <laughs> nah, that. man. That's suspicious. I would have stabbed that guy in the belly and then eat his ass. Yeah, <laughs> to top man. of top. You, you go hina hina on his ass. Hina hina. Yeah, oh, up. man. Oh, yikes. But, so, and, uh, I'm curious. Uh, oh, go ahead, Koo. Cool. Yeah. No, like, and kind of support Stratton on that. Like, I really feel like Kiro Ranke with, like, his ambition and resolve, it was actually a lot weaker compared to someone like Surumi, you know? So I feel like maybe with him dying off, I kind of like that because it simplifies the plot a little bit more. And I guess, I don't know, I really didn't like him as much either, but it wasn't like I hated the guy. I mean, but I don't know how you guys felt, if he was like probably your least favorite character out of the mm-hmm. cast or not. So I felt like they did a good thing by actually just get rid of him now at this point. Yeah, I, I think like both yeah. you guys said, you know, he's there to carry a purpose, but it's not a very heavy purpose at the end of the day. Yeah, right. you know, obviously, as we see with, with the end of season three as well with his uh, his demise. But um, well, the purpose in terms of oh, yeah, go ahead. No, oh, go I, ahead. I feel like the purpose was basically done because like his whole point was just like he just wanted like uh, a Sherpa to remember something, and she remembered it, and that was about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, we we never really get, you know, too much further backstory of Kiraranke and Wilkes relationship. Like obviously we know, you know, with their the revolutionaries and the assassination and all that. Um and obviously, you know, something going down between the two of them that led to kind of their falling out and why um the the one, you know, part of their trio absolutely despises Kiraranke for what he did, you know, to Wilk. But um I guess, you know, talking about characters that we don't really care for, I'd say for me personally um, I'd say in Karma, the you know female fortune teller that gets introduced at the end oh, of season right. one, and it's kind of oh, like yeah. the driving reason for um, 
Tanagaki to, you know, have his hate and despise for what he did to her at the end of season two when he stabs her, you know, with his blade or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like he was just a really kind of weak character. You know, obviously we we get a little bit more insight into Wilk from her and, and her kind of like admiration and kind of love relation that she had for him. But other than that, she was really a character that once she pieced out at the end of season two, I was like, good riddance. You know, there wasn't really much being done there. I don't, I don't really care what you were adding, you know, throw your, your bones or whatever you were doing, but right you know i want to focus on the characters that you know i'm emotionally invested in so i think it played yeah. out well, all things yeah. said yes yeah, as far as kiro Ranke, like i don't have strong feelings towards him one way or the other so yeah. i'm like yeah you're fine being in the crew um but i'll give you an example so in that little crew shiraishi obviously you look at him as the comedic um relief but he's also um, a, trying to be a good guy, changes ways, and partnering with Sugimoto. So that makes him fascinating, and obviously just his ridiculousness. Uh, and then Ogata, I feel, I feel Ogata is actually a very interesting character because I think he's a pretty real representation of what can happen to people as a result of war. And not fe- like I know a lot of people, not that I keep them as close friends, but I know a lot of people who still hold very sincere grudges from their childhood either against their parents or against someone else and they carry that almost as this ammo or this reason for the way they live their lives or 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 the reason like why people are the way they are and they just they try to project that onto every single person that they meet or they see and i I just think his character is fascinating in that regard like uh I, i love the voice actor who plays him obviously but i just think ogata is a very fascinating character and i hate him but I still want to see him on the screen, <laughs> right? Like, mm. it's one of those, like, it's just like in the world of fighting, there are fighters you love and there are fighters you hate. And there are certain fighters that you hate and you hate to admit they're good, but you watch them because you want to see them lose. But at mm. the end of the day, you're like, yeah, they're still pretty badass. So Kiro Ranke, he just doesn't fit in any one of those categories for me. Like, he hasn't shown enough emotion for me to be like, yeah, okay, I get the whole revolutionary fighting for minorities, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, like... He, he hasn't shown much passion, at least from what I've seen. And so, therefore, I'm just not as invested in him um, as I am the rest of the crew. I just think the rest of the crew shines so much more. Um, so his death, I you know, it, it is what it is. <laughs> so with yeah, that being I, said, yeah. though, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, I totally agree with kind of the, the relationships with Kiranki there. And then I'd say even for, for Ogata, I got like the reason, you know, why in the beginning of the, the podcast here, I related this show, you know, to Full Metal Alchemist is I kind of from Ogata get, you know, Scar or like Kimberly, if you remember the Crimson Alchemist from Full Metal Alchemist type vibes, where kind of, as you said, you know, there's just these individuals that almost kind of live for war and have these very kind of twisted views on justice. And so I found mm-hmm. myself kind of relating those characters a lot to this series. And, you know, even as, as I think you mentioned earlier, Sasha, where, um, you know, uh, Ogata is so fixated over everybody, you know, in his eyes, having this motivation that they should, you know, be able to to kill somebody with no kind of like emotions attached to it. And just as like kind of an, an ends or it needs to meet an end type of rationale. And for him to, you know, meet individuals that don't share that mindset, that's where he just kind of goes berserk and loses it and, you know, kind of gets that thirst for for the fight, if you will. So, yep. Yeah. I mean, you could you could talk all night about the different characters, various aspects of them. Mm-hmm. But let's focus on your best, what you thought was the best episode or even your favorite episode of the season and just give us a little glimpse of why. Um I will tell you guys, the one that I think is the most talked about was episode 9, which is revolutionary, and that's the one with the big reveal at the end. Now, that's not my personal favorite or my choice for the best. I thought the second to last episode was by far the best episode in the whole show, but I'm curious, what do you guys think of, one, Tsutomi's reveal, and then what would you say is your favorite or the best episode of the season? When it, when it came with Tsurumi's, like reveal, I, I kind of felt bad because at the beginning of the, the beginning of the episode, they were just showing like a bunch of like random characters that we'd never really see before. Plus, it was also having like stuff to do with Kuranaka. I was like, oh my god! I was like, I don't give a shit about this. And then like <laughs> later on, like I, I'm still like paying attention to it. I'm like I'm watching it, and then all of a sudden they, you know, we basically like, you know the 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 blonde the blonde chicks get shot, the baby. I felt bad, all that stuff. 
And then, but the whole thing is just like, oh yeah, my name isn't actually this. And then I, I was didn't really paying any kind of like, a, like I was just still kind of watching it. And then I, I, I thought maybe it was gonna be like a like an like a name reveal of somebody we don't know, but it's gonna be a major mm-hmm. character. But then when all of a sudden he like dropped his name, I was like, oh my god! I was like, what the fuck? And I actually had to basically, I ended up rewatching a good chunk of the episode just to basically like see things differently and also just make sure I didn't mm-hmm. actually miss anything. Thinking like, oh my god, because I thought like this episode like. Because at that point, I remember Sasha was telling me about how how good this episode was, and I'm thinking, all right, maybe he was talking about the last episode. I was like, this does, mm-hmm. this seems this seems terrible, <laughs> and then <laughs> then it ends up just getting uh, then the whole then after that, like it just completely changed the episode for me. Dude, it wasn't even that too. It, like when he did the voice change as well. I don't know if it was just like the yeah. the, the place that I was watching uh, mm-hmm. the episode, but yeah, like when he did the name change, I'm like oh shit, that sounds so familiar. And then when he did the name drop, like my mind was just literally blown, <laughs> dude. Like like Sharon was mentioning, like you you thought it was about uh, uh, Kiraranka, right? Mm-hmm. And then like the backstory of him and Wilk. But then you know you don't, you don't really care about these characters. So I thought this episode was gonna be really weak. But that that one drop at the end, though, like totally change, changed change the whole like, yeah. episode. So I thought that was like pretty damn cool. No, I, I totally agree. I was in you know the same boat as both of you guys. Where <laughs> once that name dropped, hit, I was like, oh shit, and did the exact same thing. Where I had to go back and watch because I was really curious, you know, if there were any type of like crumbs or things that they kind of dropped in his explanation of who he was and in his interactions with Will Kiranke and Sophia. But mm-hmm. um, I didn't really notice anything going no. back that would kind of allude to you know that being Sarumi. So um, I don't know, Sasha, if you even picked up on anything when that reveal happened in that episode, but. It was definitely one of those oh shit moments. <laughs> so sometimes I make wild guesses, and I was just like, eh, for the hell of it, if he hit Sudumi, it'd be hilarious. And then he said it, I was like, oh my god. But you know, when it hits, I was just like, okay, I wasn't expect that at all. Um, but I was like, if anybody could have this messed up of a t- of an upbringing, it probably be Sudumi. So yeah. um, that was my only inclination towards it. Yeah. it. Was just my wild intuition. Otherwise, no, like. No way I would have known, but I love the shootout right. by the way. Like that shootout was just intense. He's just blasted people left and right. Oh, They're dude, like, when yeah. the camera changed to a minigun, I was like, All right, this is <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little bit absurd of what's going on, but I love it. Yep. It's just Golden Kamui being Golden Kamui. No, it's totally legit. I can totally turn a camera into a machine gun, if I <laughs> right? <to. laughs> hey, sense. man, that's why I don't Yo, trust photographers. So, Rumi's got that hookup, okay? We don't question yeah. where he gets his goods from. <sighs> yeah, almost definitely. But yeah, no, like that was probably my my probably my favorite, my most favorite uh, moment of the episode or the season. But I still think season two or episode two was like my favorite episode of the season, just because mm. it kind of just like put everything together as to like what like Golden Kamui has to offer. Right? It had the humor, it had the character development, uh, it had like like an intense like uh, like it kind of gets on with like the plot as well. And it basically like if you didn't like this episode, like there's no way in hell you're gonna you're gonna love Golden Kamui. But it gives you everything that Golden Kamui has to offer and then some, and I thought it was just like an amazing episode. Hundred percent agree. That was a very close second for me and well Fair. said. Well Fair. said. Nice, nice. Okay. So we've gone over and glorified a lot of Golden Kamui, and it is a very golden show, no doubt. However, <laughs> As we've all mentioned, there are certain things you could pick at and say, like, ah, you know, this wasn't the greatest, or you know, some of us preferred season two, whatever it might be. Just curious, what are your guys' criticisms of season three? We've covered some of them, but uh, once again, you can go in depth here. Um, what do you guys think? Season three, where did it fall short? I mean, honestly, for me, like, I, I mean, the criticisms criticisms weren't that much. I think a big part of it was just because of because uh, I, 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 I like how. Um, B and Ku both mentioned earlier how it just seemed like there was a bunch of characters, there were a lot of moving parts, but at the same time, I don't think it would have been as bad if I wasn't um, binge watching three seasons with so much information. <laughs> so I feel like that's on me. Uh, and also, just kind of like a joke thing that I had for a criticism is like, like the the Nikado guy just needs to die. <laughs> like, like the, his his time is over. He's 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 on too much borrowed borrow time as is. Um, Very. Th- there was also a couple of kind of I just felt like not not really like, yeah i'll say like kind of like unnecessary like points in the show like the whole thing with like that uh girl's parents and like at that that uh, the lighthouse, oh, the lighthouse. yeah, Lana, ba- yeah. Yes. basically the lighthouse was used to, you know just basically so you know, they didn't die 
Um, but then the, kind of yeah. like the whole story where it's just like, and also like hold the sweat Lana where she's just like, ah, I'm just going to bail. I'm not even going to tell my parents I'm alive. I was like, I was like, I just can't handle it here. I'm just like, okay. Yeah. I was like, that's, that's kind of uh, something else. But then her little thing kind of got completely redeemed because of the guy from the, from the, uh, what basically joined her from the, uh, the Stenka arc. <laughs> For the episode, oh yeah, the, 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 yeah, the tattooed oh. prisoner, yeah, yeah, he's just like, so he's like, cool or something. yeah, he's just like, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll just go with you, and then they had like the little things, like, oh, surprisingly, they made it pretty good, <laughs> yeah, but that's story for another time, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but that's yeah. that's all I had though. I agree. I, I just thought her character, I'm like, eh, I don't really care about the situation. Her parents mm-hmm. seem cool, but at the end of the day, let's just not go. It, it feels like that awkward side quest that you have to do in an RPG in order to get back <laughs> to the main storyline. So you're like, oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would say that's a minor quip for me, too. My my thing is, I thought this was an excellent season. I gave it a 10 on Mal. But with that being said, I'm not saying a 10 means absolutely no criticisms. I, I would say after such a strong episode about Tsurumi and his character and then the episode before that was the Batosai Slayer episode with uh, Hijikata and you know him finishing off an old rival we got zero about them after that which was hmm. sad to me because you, you get so invested into the characters you're like dude if they would have just had like literally five minutes of the last episode just flashing back to them and showing where they're at with their plans or with their hunt for the uh, tattoos Boom. That would that would be like the cherry on top, the icing on top, right? But with with that being said, it was just uh it was difficult because damn, what an episode to leave us on about Tsudomi and then to not see or hear from him again for the rest of the season. Mm-hmm. I just wish just a little bit. Just keep, come on, just a little bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, yeah, I, 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 go, no, go ahead. Oh no, uh so yeah, like I totally agree with that. But I think with Surumi, they did him enough justice that I was okay with not seeing him anymore, like uh from that point on. Uh but That's yeah, a good with, point. with Hijikata though, like yeah, with the after the uh like the, the execution he did of the other samurai guy, like I totally uh would have wished for more story on him because I felt like he didn't get enough airtime, right? Because it wasn't really just about him, it was about the other guy as well. So it was like two backstories in one episode. And I actually felt like that was the weakest uh, episode of the season just because it didn't really add much to the plot of the story and then mm. with my criticism for season three is it becomes very the plot becomes very convoluted again and then they did try to simplify things with the death of uh kiro Ranke at the end uh so it does simplify things a little bit but the fact is is you know everyone's like all buddy buddy like uh, it feels like the direction of the story is lost because you know you don't really know who's the villain who's the who's going to be the hero like what's uh what the major plans are and everyone's just kind of doing their own thing so i think that's what my biggest criticism about season three was mm-hmm. no i i totally agree with everything you guys say and i i think you know the common point that we all touched on was especially hijikata and his group it was almost you know this season was just kind of like that one off of like, hey guys, we're here. We still exist. Don't forget mm-hmm. about us. Okay, <laughs> yeah. we only got one episode. We'll see you later. And it's, it's definitely frustrating, you know, to not have any closure or any kind of um, preview, if you will, of like, okay, how are they going to get mixed up with their groups again? You know, what what really have they been doing other than just having kind of this one meetup between old rivals, so to speak. So that was definitely something that I, that I viewed as a low point or a critique of season three. Um, I think the other thing for me personally was um i know you guys mentioned you know the circus episode and and you guys you know kind of liking the the comic relief and and lightheartedness of it um it felt for me even though i think that's a point and a thing that golden community does really well it almost just felt like a filler like there wasn't really anything gained from it like you know maybe you could argue that you know we get to see koito's you know love for sarumi especially in that episode when he's flying across <laughs> the trapeze and doing all these crazy acrobatics to uh to get the photo of him um so that was you know something that that i thought was really fun and lighthearted. but again you know talking about episodes where when you think about how did it progress the plot nothing really happened it just reinforced you know sugimoto's this guy that even after you know performing actual hirikiri or whatever you know seppuku can't die and you know just the outrageousness of these characters so Mm -hmm. um still enjoyed it but i definitely would say out of all the episodes uh, second to you know hijikata's uh, episode those were definitely kind of the the two low points where i was